Greetings. Welcome to our show, Ghosts Are Near, where we discuss various aspects of the paranormal and paranormal investigation. With me is my co-host, Sandra Johnson. Hello again. And my other co-host, Carl Johnson. Hello there. Sandra and I are the founders of New England Anomalies Research. We are paranormal investigators. And I'd like to welcome our live audience this evening. Glad to have you with us. And we have a very special guest with us. Tom D'Agostino is an accomplished musician. He's also a prolific author and a veteran of 24 years of paranormal investigation himself. Tom, I'd like to welcome you to our show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Wow, oh, glad to have you. Now tell me, how did you get into paranormal investigation in the first place? What was your catalyst? Well, actually, I grew up in a house that was haunted, and a lot of stuff happened there growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, when you're a kid, you know, you put it out of your mind or whatever, but my brothers and sisters actually used to sleep downstairs because <laughs> they were yeah. afraid to go upstairs. Not bad. Yeah, and that kind of got me interested in reading ghost stories and getting into it, but what really made me start investigating was when I stayed at a house in Situate uh, for six days. Mm -hmm. we, I was going to live there, actually, but I moved out after six days, and a lot of things happened there. Mm -hmm. Everything from... Uh, we saw an apparition, uh, noises downstairs of furniture moving, where I actually put powder on the floor to see if there was someone doing it, and the powder would be undisturbed. The furniture hadn't been moved for years. Uh, we, one night, we heard someone come bounding up the stairs that we were standing at the top of, and we had a wind rush right by us after that. Mm -hmm. So no one else would come in the house either, so being there all alone, I just figured, hey, I better get out of here myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a friend of mine never moved into it, actually. He sold it. So that's why... You moved out after six days. Yes, too many things were happening. Wow. <clears throat> How do you feel nowadays, Tom, if you were to experience that level of phenomena, that consistent phenomenon? I'd like want to stay there a year. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'd have equipment rolling and now, yeah, I'd be You're checking right after. Skin to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at first, you know, I, I was I used to get scared like that or a little nervous, but now I'll run right after them. <laughs> now I understand for several years you've been a member of Rhode Island Paranormal. Yes, Is that correct. What are some of your experiences with that group? Uh, we've gone to, <coughs> we've done a few investigations. We did Nine Men's Misery, mm -hmm. and we did one. What exactly is Nine Men's Misery? Oh, Nine Men's Misery is <coughs> a place in Cumberland, in the woods of the monastery, where in King's Philip War in 1675, the Rehoboth militia was under fire with uh, Indian marauders who actually tricked them in. They pretended they were wounded, and when the militia came after them, they uh, had an extra band waiting. They surrounded them, started f just railing them left and right. Nine men were captured when uh, the Rehoboth militia had to break up and run. And these nine men were slaughtered right on the spot. And some say they cut their heads off, and others say they were skinned alive. But I don't think they had that kind of time. They just <coughs> killed them quickly and took off. Mm -hmm. And Captain Michael Pierce was the leader of the brigade. When he got reinforcements and came back, they found the nine men. They buried them on the spot. They really didn't know who they were until the 1870s when they were dug up again. And there's a giant tomb there. People have heard screams from the area. They've heard and seen uh, apparitions and orbs. And according to some people, they've even seen a dark horse, dark rider appear and run down one of the paths and disappear and the ghost of a child in the swamp area next to the tomb of the Nine Men's Misery. Hmm. <coughs> very, very interesting. Yeah. Now, you've written several articles for Fate magazine. Yes. Mm -hmm. And recently, you've had your own book published. Yes. <coughs> what is the title of that book? Haunted Rhode Island. Haunted Rhode Island Haunted by Rhode Tom D'Agostino. Wow. And uh, I can think of no better authority on Haunted Rhode Island than you, Tom. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about some of the stories. Ah, okay. We have, in the book, is a story of the carousel mm -hmm. in... East Providence. I used to write it when I was a kid, and I was afraid of it then. And I haven't written it since. I won't be afraid of it, though. <laughs> 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 we have uh, in Cumberland, there is the monastery in Nine Men's Misery. In Foster, we have the Ramtail Factory, uh -huh. which is our personal favorite. Right. In Barville, we have the Indian ghost of Hannah Frank mm -hmm. and the two graves there. 
And there's so many of them. There's just a lot of them that I really love and, and enjoyed investigating. Wow. Could you pick one and uh, el elaborate a little bit more? Maybe one of your, your favorite? Actually, my favorite's always been the Ramtail Factory. Uh -huh. Well, we like to hear about that. <laughs> right, you've been there ourselves with you. Mm. <laughs> okay. The Ramtail Factory is in the woods of Foster. Only the remains are left, but in 1822, May 19th, Pay Lake Walker who was a partner in the factory, hung himself from the bell rope. What happened was he, was he was a partner, and I guess he spent too much money, and he became very broke and despondent. And he had an argument with the owners, which was happened to have been his in-laws. And he mentioned something of the fact that they would someday take the keys to the mill from a dead man's pocket. And on May 19, 1822, he hung himself. They buried him, and the things went on. The mill was also part of a village. There's a, there is foundations there were once midden kitchens and houses. But the bell started ringing at midnight. Now, this was the bell he used to ring as a night watchman every morning to summon the workers to the workday, and then his shift would be over. The bell started ringing at midnight once, and they called to the factory, and they saw that nobody was inside. So they kind of just figured, you know, it was maybe a prankster. But this happened two more times before they had to remove the rope. When they removed the rope, the bell rang at midnight again. And this time, they had to remove the bell. One night afterwards, the whole village was awoken by the sound of the mill in full blast churning. The water wheel, the spindles, the looms. And when they got there, they found not only was the mill working fully, but running opposite the Ponagansett River. Really? Yes. I mean, the large water wheel was actually yes. going against the current? Exactly. How does that explain? Can <coughs> that happen naturally, the water wheel just turning against the current? No, of the air? no, not that I could understand. And of course, the people were already in fear, so whether or not it was actually true or legend is a matter of our conjecture. But it is mentioned in two books that the factory is haunted. Because the people started leaving, the factory went out of business shortly afterwards. And in one book, the agricultural book uh, in Round Historical Library says that this is the reason why the factory went out of business is because the people were too afraid to work in it. Wow. Yes. And in another book, the Round Census of 1885, on page 36, the factory is labeled as haunted. Isn't and that Rhode Island's official haunting? Yes, it's the officially it haunted site yeah. in Rhode Island, as per because of these writings in archive books. It's on the books. It's on the books. <laughs> and, and what have you it's yourself the experienced there? Have you been able to gather any evidence? Yes, actually I've done, oh God, 40 investigations there at wow. least. And some more impromptu, but others longer ones. And one of the early ones was with a friend of mine where we held vigil on the, that o a little ridge that overlooks the factory. And while we were sitting, after about 45 minutes, we started seeing like a light which was about oblong, and it was moving through the air. And it started moving towards around the factory walls. And my friend, well, I guess he wasn't as seasoned as I was. He ran <laughs> <laughs> with the only flashlight, too, mind you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it, it moved away and it disappeared into the woods. <laughs> was that yeah. the end of his career in paranormal yeah, investigation? Yeah, I wouldn't take him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if you get over that hump, you can keep going. Yeah, yeah once, you, once you can see the apparitions and not be afraid. But um, I deduced later that the height of the apparition, or what we saw, the anomaly, was actually where the floor of the factory used to be. Oh, my. Mm. So, in other words, it seemed to be hovering. It wasn't just walking on the ground. Right. Which yes. is an interesting characteristic of apparitions, that sometimes they seem to be hovering, or they seem to be a little bit below what seems to be the floor of the ground level. And it's ascertained later that that would have been the level of that a living would person would have walked on in that right. area. Yes. And that, and that was one instance. Another instance is when I went there with a few other people, and we were uh, in the dark again, and we could hear a lantern start swinging. And it got closer, and it came right by us, and we could see each other. And it disappeared out towards the foundations behind us, and then it came back again. And in this time, the few people I was with, they didn't run because they were too afraid, and it was too dark, so they didn't run this time. <laughs> they, they waited for me to finish <laughs> the investigation, but they never went back either. And they swore to this day up and down that they'll never do it again. And, and later on, another person who wrote to me had the same experience. He went there doing an investigation, and he heard the lantern as well. Now, when that was a working mill, who would have been carrying a lantern at night? Pay Lake Walker would have been doing the rounds of each little building, 
carrying a lantern, of course, being the 1820s and the only source of light. And I understand you're familiar with the sound of a lantern creaking. Yes, we use them at our house still. Uh -huh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've converted most of our lights, old lanterns, into regular lights, which we can carry around and hang. Mm -hmm. and it gives a nice effect. I've got to get back over to your house. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of good things there. I've heard yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah, it's an old house with old stuff. <laughs> now, Tom, haunted? you're yeah, haunted probably. Of course. It, it's got to be by now. <laughs> You've seen numerous apparitions. I know you can't always determine that they're spirits of deceased people, but you've seen a lot of strange things. Yes. May I ask you, what do you think a ghost is? How would you define a, a spirit or an apparition or a ghost? In all the experiences that I've had, uh, they seem to lean towards two ideas, and, and one of them is a residual haunting, mm -hmm. which is more like uh, the Earth replaying a magnetic moment in time, much like when we make our CDs or tapes or DVDs. You can replay it. Well, the Earth is magnetic, and this is how we, obviously, we have a magnetic north, which proves it. And this is how we can make all these other items for our, you know, pleasure of listening and watching. Right. And it will replay this moment in time. It could do it eight times in an hour, or once every eight years, or at random. And this is, it could do it when nobody is there. It could do it as you as a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And it could be because of pressure zones, or just a very heavy magnetic field. And that I've seen happen a lot of times. So it just replays this thing, and you see it, and then it's gone. It's nothing to do like with you, nothing to do with, uh, you know, If a anything. tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it indeed make a sound? Right. It's, you know, a point of conjecture, but right. a similar principle. And, yes. Perhaps these replay themselves, and there's nobody around to interpret them. Exactly. At the time. The other form is just energy itself of maybe a living being, a strong will, or a, or a being, or just a collective amount of energy, because energy obviously is never... Uh, recreated, just transfer it, and it can collect more in one place and less in another. And these type of things is where we get the, the attempts at manifestations. Because mm -hmm. I've always noticed every time we get cold spots and something is trying to manifest, as they say, it never does. Mm -hmm. We experience these cold spots or we get EVPs, but it's never associated with the other type, with the actual body coming towards you, yeah. talking and in, in, in causing cold spots. So it's kind of, I've, I've, those are the two, and I'm always wondering if they are not associated with each other at all. The apparition and the actual encounters of uh, the energy of cold spots and EVPs and the EMF meters going off. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Or maybe it's, it's just uh, impossible for these forces to tap into enough energy to both appear and then cause uh, the other anomalies to happen at the same time. Right. A lot of people say, oh, you know, they're trying to get enough energy to manifest, but I, I, I've never seen it happen. I've never seen it get enough, like, uh, sat, what was it, Saturday morning, actually, when we were in the basement of the mansion, and there was four of us there, and the temperature dropped to 50 degrees instantly, and our equipment was cold. We had uh, goosebumps on our arms, our noses were cold. And the meters were going off, but nothing manifested. And could anything like else account <coughs> for that? Sorry to interrupt, but could anything else account for that drop in temperature? Well, no, because the thing was we had one, and then nothing I can explain right off the bat, because we had one thermometer that as we were standing in the circle of four that was taking the reading of us, and I had my thermometer that was shining on the walls only some, in some cases, eight inches away to two mm -hmm. feet away, that was taking a reading of 70 degrees. Really? Oh, that's quite a yeah, drastic in the change. Floor, yeah, 20 degrees in just our little pocket. That fluctuation in that small amount yeah. of time. And everyone's got nice personality, so it wasn't them being cold, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this was um, <coughs> an investigation that you were asked an to do? An overnight investigation, in the, yes. In the Berkshires in yes. Massachusetts? Yes. Uh -huh. An overnight investigation in the Holton Mansion. Now, of mm -hmm. course, your lovely wife, Arlene, often accompanies you on paranormal investigations. Every single one. And she's the mm -hmm. photographer right. for the two of you, right? Right. And she does handle some EMF meters, mm -hmm. but she's mostly photography. She was in the mansion. Uh, she, I understand she had an experience with her camera. Yes, yes. <coughs> we went into the Witter's room, which they called John Witter's room, because they, they've taken a picture in the window and seen an apparition in the window that looks like him. Mm -hmm. So they call it the Witter's room. And some things go on there, well, we went in there with a few other investigators. We were in groups of four. And she went to sit down on a trunk. And when she did, the camera literally exploded. It, it, the uh, lens came off. And as anyone knows, it takes two hands to take a lens off. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but simultaneously, 
the flash came off the camera and the flash cover came off the camera with the batteries and everything flew in all directions. And something hit her, causing a bruise on her thumb as well. Mm. And uh, the stuff flew everywhere. Nobody could explain it. One of the girls that was also doing the investigation saw it just come apart. Talk about equipment failure. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel any sense of hostility or malice then? I know that's an, a subjective experience, but did you or anybody else report that they felt an impressiveness at the time? Uh, no. So there was nothing else going on? I mean, the, the temperature change didn't coincide with No, the temperature change was uh, about 1 in the morning. The camera thing was about 10. Mm -hmm. And we did feel like not really hostility, but at some point it felt like an we were irritating something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they really Irritating the attention. atmosphere, at least, in, in a couple of the rooms, not all of them. One room that it was supposed to be the most haunted, all we got was EVPs, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Anything else was just very, very calm. Some people have been very happy to get EVPs. <laughs> yeah, we got several and we have to analyze. Yeah. Now, you and your wife have recently formed Parano Paranormal United Research Society. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, and so it's just you as a couple tend to go out and sometimes you join other investigators. Is that correct? Right, that's what we intend. That was the intentions of it, as being like a coalition where we could either be called or call people and uh, just get everybody together as a big group of, you know, everybody, the best people who can possibly find and go out and do the, an investigation according to what the needs are of the people mm -hmm. that are calling for uh, some cases, you know, it could be like in demonologists or some cases they want something else and just to be able to call people and have them, the, the friendliness there. Mm -hmm. where a lot of groups, they kind of not so friendly or they just want to hog it all for themselves and we're not about that because a, there is a science here that needs to be learned and I agree. Right. everybody knows something that other people don't know and to get a nice, be able to ha have a coalition all the time where people can be all cooperative. Mm -hmm. and it's more effective and you get better results if there's an air of camaraderie. And positive yeah, energy. And mutual cooperation. Yes, and, and like I said, I, I don't know much about demonology. My, you know, I have different studies and I know other people don't know much about this, that, and the other thing. So to get everyone together, you get this big, great coalition of minds and you can mm -hmm. either find something or find that it is nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody has mm -hmm. something to add. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's basically what, what the whole point of that is. Mm -hmm. So you do have times where you go in to investigate a residence or a site and you don't find any results that you can determine are paranormal in nature. I could show you about 600 pictures of nothing. <laughs> 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 nice scenery in many cases, but... <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of yeah, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, many times. Many times we found that uh, the re rational explanations, people will call you off the wall because their stereo is talking to them. And in one case, I went to a place where it was talking to them, but they lived in an area near where I lived, and I it guess it's a pressure zone where it receives a lot of radio waves from even CB truckers 25, 30 miles away. And most radios say they don't turn off, they go on standby. You got the cassette, the CD. Yeah. And that's what was happening. And all of a sudden this frequency would come through and these people would stand, they don't understand it, they don't understand who it might be. And they actually thought it was a ghost in the house. And I found out that it just was actually CB truckers. You mm -hmm. could tell by the lingo, you could tell by the language. Well, those are valuable <laughs> results as well, if a bit disappointing at times. Well, I don't yeah, think it was disappointing they, because yeah. it puts them at ease. As long as right. people, when, yeah, when they, they call on you and they, they, they want to be put yeah. at ease, that, mm. that I found that to be a very highly successful venture also. that It was a series of coincidences that created a, you know, a, a paranoia. Mm -hmm. And they wanted yeah. it solved. That's good. Very good. Well, good call on your part. a successful investigation. Yes. I mean, you didn't get any evidence, but right, yeah, you, you but I did there. right. Yeah, well, question. I am not a skeptic. <clears throat> I'm not going to go running and saying this place is not haunted. But at the same time, I'm not going to go running and flailing my arms, yelling ghosts. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I go in and look at all the everything going on, all the, the things, the house, everything, the history of the house. Uh, having been living in old houses all my life and stuff, you mm -hmm. can figure out many noises and creaks and things like that. You can even see sometimes from the structure. So you try to find a happy medium. Yeah, I go in, uh, when someone Excuse calls me, yeah. I, do an, I want to do an interviews. And mm -hmm. I want to find out what they're s seeing and hearing. 
Because many, sometimes, I, like one person put it, which was uh, very good, he said, I don't need to know the place is haunted. I've read documentation for a hundred years from people who never knew each other, never knew the other documentation existed, mm. having the same exact description. Mm -hmm. So in that case, okay, yeah, you know, th that's fine. But a lot of times I'll go into a place and I'll just look around and mull around and I'm not expecting to see anything. I'm not expecting not to see anything. I'm, I'm looking to find out all the rational clues and rational answers first. Right. Collect all the data, then you collate yeah. and... If you go in as a skeptic, you'll overlook one side of it. Right. If you go in as a believer, you'll overlook another side. Mm -hmm. So I just go in as an investigator looking to f solve the crime. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, another location which is considered a Rhode Island hot spot, as far as hauntings go, Cumberland Monastery. What can you tell me about that? The monastery, uh, it's actually haunted by a monk mm -hmm. that supposedly closes books <laughs> when, when unattended. But I did get an email from a monk who, who is now retired, and he lives in Minneapolis or somewhere like that. When he was there, he used to hear chiseling and hammering of stone. And what the, I guess the Monsignor told him was, that was the ghosts of the former monks still toiling. Hmm. And when they moved, the, the Trappists moved to, I think it was Swansea. When they moved to Swansea, they didn't take their interred right away. And when they came to pick them up, when they used to inter the, their, their people, they would put them on a board, on a shroud, and they would just nail the shroud down to the point of the cross being humble, no mm -hmm. coffin, and then bury them like that to give them back to the earth. Mm -hmm. One of the early burials was totally preserved, totally undecayed. Really? And incorruptible? Yes. Well, that's interesting. They wanted to apply it for sainthood, but being Trappist monks, it was, you know, they, they couldn't, they, it, I guess they didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he, he told me about that also. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, stories uh, like from your book or, or that you've written uh, about outside of your book that, that you could tell us? Outside of the book? I know I have a, a favorite. I, I think it's in the book, though. What's that? Mercy Brown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. She's <laughs> rather famous around here. She's yeah. famous all over Very well known. Yeah. 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 Rhode Island Vampire. Yeah. Alleged. I've been there, and I've never, I've never had any experiences or anything at this grave or any, uh, anything like that. No anomalies, no, no orbs or anything, even with the pictures. But the story is rather interesting that, you know, she would, uh, had tuberculosis, and they called it consumption in those days. And mm -hmm. she's one of the documented vampires of Rhode Island. There's several of them. And when she, actually her mother died earlier, and her sister died, and when her brother Edwin became sick, sh uh, she died, and they thought it was Mercy making her sick. At the time in January, she was kept in the keep, which is a rather interesting thing all old cemeteries have. Mm -hmm. The keep is a building that is used for two purposes. One, you couldn't dig in the winter when the ground is frozen. Right. And two, when people died, we, they didn't have the technology they have today to tell, some people would go into those comas and they'd wake up a few days later. That's why they used to call them wakes also. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Makes and sense. Yeah. And they'd put them in the keep with a bell and some food. And if they woke up after three or four days, well, it, the funny thing is sometimes the keeps were pretty much isolated. <laughs> they'd be <laughs> ringing the bell till they died. And <laughs> <laughs> then it became a wake up. Then it became, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, she was yeah. in the keep and uh, obviously well preserved being in January. And when they went to fetch her, actually Mr. Brown, the father, didn't believe in this and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So they went, a uh, doctor from Wakefield, Dr. Metcalf, and, and the villagers with the you know, pitchforks and torches went <laughs> down there. <laughs> and they dug her up. And of course she was well preserved, being blood in her heart and her hair and nails had grown because she had just died. They saw she was a vampire, so they cut out her heart, burned the ashes, and fed it to Edwin, who really? passed away in May. Right. Yeah, that was a common thing, was to cut out the organs, burn them, and put the ashes in medicine. And this is a true documented case? True documented case, yep. Newspapers got a hold of it. Um, Bram Stoker got a hold of it. To Bram write Stoker, novel. author of Dracula, that was in his papers, in his yes. estate. Yes, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yes, okay. that's why he uses the town of Exeter in his book. Ah. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Right Point. from Little Rhodey. Mm -hmm. I must have uh, made Rhode Island look a, a bit backward, even well, to the people. You're, you're 20 miles from Providence <laughs> where they had treatment for tuberculosis, yeah. and 
They finally, and this you was know, in the newspapers. And the when it got too. to the newspaper, the, peop the doctors from Providence rushed down and said, what are you hicks doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're burning people for something they could have gotten treatment for 20 miles away. <laughs> well, I understand that basically put a stop to it, too. Yes, it did. It did. So. Tom, we just have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask you, um, do you ever get afraid anymore? Or you, can you picture yourself going into the site of a paranormal investigation or a reported haunting and being apprehensive, being afraid, actually. Actually, no, the, the, the not anymore. Like they said, I'm the, I'm the you know, nut who runs toward the danger. <laughs> I, I get thrilled. I get thrilled. Like my whole body starts getting, you know, the heart starts pumping and everything, and the hair stands up, and I get really thrilled when I feel something happening or something is happening. I, I really, because I want to find the answers. I want to find proof. I want everything. I want to, if I could ask the thing, whatever, an anomaly or questions, all night long I would. <laughs> I, I think the majority of investigators are like that. When you've been doing this for so many years. Desensitized think, is a good word, maybe, or just. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, but I, I, I mean, that's the, the reason you, that you get into this in the first place, is yes. like the fascination. Yeah, I think you, you're so anxious to actually learn and experience and discover. Yes, that. that's the thing. I'd love to have all the answers, but until somebody can die, come back three months later, you know, with the notebook. Right. Hey, God, this is what they all told me. <laughs> right. That would be really helpful. <laughs> yeah, they tried that uh, with Harry Houdini. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would, but it would be interesting nonetheless. Now, you're, you're working on a new book, I understand, too. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, Haunted Massachusetts. We just finished it. Haunted New Hampshire is in the oh, first galley. Wow. Yeah, Haunted New Hampshire will be out next year. And Haunted Massachusetts, we just finished. And it was on the same premise. All places you can visit that are haunted. Wow. And uh, there's a lot of places. I think you could do Haunted Foster and Haunted Situate, too. If yeah. You to haunted Exeter. <laughs> oh, yeah. The gr it's a gr yeah. Rhode Island has, actually, Rhode Island had more haunts than all the other states per size and capita. Wow. wow. Yeah, it really did. And it also has more cemeteries than any other state in the country. Why do you suppose that is? Yeah, they buried them on their land, the farmers. I've gone into, like you said, cemeteries with two graves in it. Mm -hmm. It's still a historical cemetery. Barville 108 mm -hmm. ha is only two graves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's still designated as a cemetery. Yes, it is. It's a cemetery with a historical plaque on it. And that's why, because they all buried the, the kin on their farmland and whatnot. And so you got to... Garden cemeteries came about in the 1840s, and don't forget, as we push more west, so did the United States come about around that time. Right. Mm -hmm. Swan Point being a uh, yes, Swan prime Point. example. Yes. Well, Tom, I very much want to thank you for being our guest today, and I hope you make a return trip because we've just oh, uh, definitely. basically mm -hmm. scratched the scratched surface the with surface. your extensive you know? knowledge, you know? By the way, who is that? Who's that on your t-shirt there? H.P. Lovecraft. Ah, <laughs> <him>. My <laughs> brother's favorite, yeah? Yep. I would have worn my H.P. Lovecraft t-shirt if I knew you were wearing it. We that. have his artwork on our wall. Excellent. The, the rubbing. Sandra, <laughs> would you, um, oh, would you yes. give us uh, some info on yes, our I contact? I'll do that, methods? indeed. As always, we'd like you to know we at New England Anomalies Research are available to research local alleged hauntings or assist those of you who may be experiencing unexplained phenomena in your home or place of business. We'd also like to hear from you. If you have a show suggestion or even if you would like to be a guest on Ghosts Are Near, so give us a shout at ghostsarenear at inbox.com. We'll believe you. Thank you very much. And again, look forward to having you back, Tom. Thanks. Thank I look you, forward Tom. to it. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, th this has been fascinating. And we look forward to Tom's return. And until next thank time, you. goodbye, friends, and God bless.